a hundred percent of the time you were under a state of construction and all your body knows is environmental stimuli you know so you have this amazing opportunity to through exposure therapy you can start to make yourself be stronger or weaker so if you don't expose your body to enough exposure in the form of heat in the form of cold in the form of some type of hermetic stressor then the body will start to atrophy because it's inherently incredibly lazy is it, there won't be a single shot where i can put my hand in all of these will there not really I mean, I guess it's kind of oh d- do you need to see it i thought it was just an audio thing well no because what so you're trying to you're do is you're blip. syncing you're syncing the audio with the video can watch uh, it. Oh, I thought it was just an audio blip, but yeah, you're right. God dang it. What can I say, man? I'm not a videographer. No, no, but that's... I just like clapping. I just hate to clap. Maybe we both clap. Yes. Boom! Fucking All angles! Podcast we're time. We're in! Podcast time. Yeah, we're locked in. Aaron Alexander, welcome to the show. Christopher, thank you for making this happen. It's been a, a god dang pleasure getting to know you over the last few weeks. So good, man. Yeah. Yeah. The bromance has happened quickly. The bromance is real. It's got serious. Yep. Very fast. Yep. We're moving quick. How would you describe your approach to fitness? I've been very interested since I've been out here. We've trained a fair bit. We've done some sessions barefooted in on it doing sprint training and contralateral movements and all manner of different things that as someone that spent a lot of time training, I've seen online, but I've not really been exposed to very much. And I'm quite interested to work out how you arrive at whatever view of health and fitness it is that you have. Yeah. Um, So my first, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Uh, My background mostly was in manual therapy. Like my main field of of specialty is working with people from hands-on body work. Uh, And before that it was, it was training uh, but my main interest really has been helping people come into alignment with their bodies uh, so that we can get them to a point that when they move through their lives, uh, as they are breathing, as they're just living their lives, they can be almost self-organizing into a greater place of alignment, of balance, of homeostasis just through their existence. And that sounds a little bit maybe like meta and out there. Um, so specifically what that means is looking at what are the the variables, the environmental conditions that are forming the body to fit into the positions that might create discomfort or disease. And so my approach to fitness um, isn't so much about what we're doing in a gym. It's more what we're doing for all the times that we're not in the gym. And I consider the, the gym to be, for me, the gym's like uh, my buddy Kelly Starrett, who he did the, the forward for my my book coming up. Um, he calls it like classical ballet. You know, so when you're in the gym, you're working on these classical forms to bring your body into balance enough that you can go out and do modern dance. You know, modern dance is the rest of your life. And so what I'm really interested with with fitness predominantly is uh, how do you start to integrate the concepts that you'd learn in a gym, in a yoga studio, um, in a martial arts studio, into the way that you show up in business, in you know, when you're out on a date with somebody, when you're at your house watching Netflix, all of that is fitness. And your body doesn't know the difference between I'm in a yoga studio or I'm just you know at my, my house in my underpants. What would you say to someone that says, fitness and my training in the gym has nothing to do with how I show up in business, fitness is for fitness, and movement is for movement. Why does it matter about how I train in the gym relates to how I show up for a date? Yeah. So it's like the the idea of, you know, being uh, taking 20 years to be an overnight success. You know, we're cultivating, we're, we're grooving paths, you know, neuro, neuro, neurological paths, muscular paths, neuromuscular paths every day throughout every moment. You know, so your body doesn't know an off and on. Right now, as we're sitting in this position, you are generating electrical stimuli in around your hips and any place that your body's coming in contact with the with the chair. You know, so the, the term for that is mechanotransduction. You're squishing cells, you might be shearing cells, you might be twisting cells, and then there's gonna be a chemical response, a chemical translation to that. And within that, that pushing that's happening against your hips, there's electrical charge around that space, it's called piezo 
electricity. That's going to be sending a signal to the cells that would be building connective tissue or bone tissue or muscle tissue or fascia. And what you're sending within these signals, you're, you're like the engineer of your body. You're saying, okay, we need to beef up in this space around maybe, you know, maybe you have bunions in your feet. So you actually can see like a callousing of specific tissue. That's just wear and tear in that specific range of motion. So you're sending that electricity based off of the way that you live your daily life. And then, you know, the fibro blasts and the fibro class, these little cells that either add tissue or take tissue away, they respond accordingly. Uh, and you are structuring yourself just by sitting in a chair. And so when you take that mindset of like, holy crap, like right now, I'm literally under a state of construction. When you get up off of this chair, you're, you're tuned up to perform in the shape that you've been practicing most. You know, so a thing that you might have heard is practice doesn't make perfect practice, practice makes permanent. So throughout the day, you're continually practicing how to engage or inhabit your physical body. And then when it does come time to show up in a meaningful way, you got to pick up a, you know, a heavy trailer, you know, or something, you know, you got to suddenly sprint across a parking lot or whatever it may be. Your body is tuned up and queued up to be able to perform because you spent the last day, week, month, year in more of like a kind of like a ready position. And then you can be too ready, you know, where you're too queued up, you're in like sympathetic overdrive and that's going to be too much. If you're adding too much stiffness into the system, then the system can't uh, rest and digest and heal and repair. You know, so this isn't what I'm saying doesn't mean that you always have to have like a stick up your ass and have like axial extension, like your spine's back. You know, you look perfectly enlightened and samadhi and spiritual and strong and stable. Uh, it's being able to relax, but being able to relax into functionality. The way that we can relax into functionality, um, you know, there's specific things that we can talk about. What would you say, looking at the current trends in fitness and training, what would you say are the main areas that people are missing out on? Or what are the main problems that you're seeing with most people's training programs? Well... I mean, there's a lot of things. It depends. It really depends on what gym you're in. You know, so if you go to a most traditional, you know, like a 24 hour fitness type space, um, there's a lot of disintegration or myopic focus on specific muscles without much awareness to integrating the whole, putting the whole body together to work as, as, as one, one integrated body. Um, so when you're excessively focused on myopically breaking down individual, like a muscle by muscle approach, you just can't do it. Like you can't organize 640 odd muscles, depends on the specific individual, you know, 360 joints. It's just, it's too much chaos. You know, so for you to be able to go in and really think like, you know, joint by joint, muscle by muscle, I'm going to be engaging these and then i'm gonna it's just gonna magically all come together um, that can be confusing for the body you know so what do you mean by confusing it can be confusing for the body in the sense that if you don't train athleticism you won't just self-organize and be athletic okay so breaking the component parts of uh, musculature apart yeah and training biceps and triceps and overhead extensions and chest press and yeah. blah blah yeah so if you're excessively aesthetically focused it's f completely fine there's mo no moralistic judgment um juji mufu is a good example of this where he has done a, a, a pretty good job of integrating um, athleticism and calisthenics and gymnastics and powerlifting and bodybuilding you know so he's a bit of an oddity in his ability to to juggle a lot of variables and it's really beautiful he to calls watch. himself a, a hybrid athlete right <clears throat> he is that's what he refers to yeah himself. that's what that's what he is or a polyathlete i can't remember yeah you know and then within within that i would say you know athletics goes beyond just you know musculoskeletal integration but also um you know how's your response to uh, cold temperatures how's your response to heat why is that part of fitness why would someone who says oh, I've, i do fitness i've got a fitness plan do you do hot and cold exposure no i don't okay why what would you say to someone who's the same way that your body has a physiological adaptation 
you know, a, a hermetic stress. We were talking on my podcast before this, we're talking about hermetic stressors in our lives. The same way that you'd have that to develop um, muscle cells to be able to be stronger in a specific position as a product of going through, you know, a bicep curl or a deadlift or whatever you're doing. Uh, your body has a similar physiologic response to being exposed to cold temperatures, has a similar physio- physiological response to being exposed to heat, has a similar physiological response to being exposed to altitude. You know, and so your body is continually changing. And this is the thing that we that we started off with. A hundred percent of the time you were under a state of construction. And all your body knows is environmental stimuli. You know, so you have this amazing opportunity to through exposure therapy, uh, it just you can start to make yourself be stronger or w- weaker. You know, so if you don't expose your body to enough exposure um, in the form of heat, in the form of cold, in the form of heat, in the form of some type of hermetic stressor, uh, then the body will start to atrophy because it's inherently incredibly lazy. And that laziness, it's 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 like one of the key features in our capacities to survive. What would you say, let's talk about some physical practices yeah. for a bit. Yeah. What are some of the physical practices that you think, I know that you're big into groundedness and getting hips below knees, that's one of them. Yeah, that's a thing. What about that and some of the other physical practices that you think people should just play around with? A little bit more when they're in the gym the sense of play itself is also another part of what i've noticed in the sessions i've done with you yeah. uh is is a rarity so let's talk about that yeah so we all human beings are riding on millennia of spending time with our hips below our knees spending time moving along you know not necessarily like crawling along the ground all that's a part of your your developmental patterns and depending upon your belief system evolution that was probably a thing as well and you're probably swinging through trees if you believe in evolution as well you're an arboreal creature and uh, you know and then that transition to being a, a bipedal mammal cruising along the land um, you know but that's a lot of that's kind of it could change depending upon you know what, what you think so it's it's, it's all hypothetical like where, exactly where we came from um, but getting down on the ground if you just look at like present day thoughts on evolution aside look at any child the way that a child navigates their own physiology and their own construction of themselves is they will squat they will sit you know in like kind of like a cross-legged position maybe a straddle position uh maybe at some point they'll start to kneel uh and so they're spending a lot of time in that low position and that's what you see as well looking at hunter-gatherer tribes, specifically the, the Hatsa people in northern Tanzania is where there's been research about this uh, from University of Southern California, specifically is where this came out of. Uh, researchers went out there and measured the amount of time that Hatsa people were spending in resting positions because the big idea is like, you know, we're like this culture of sedentarism. It's killing us. It's causing all of our issues and metabolic disease and depression and uh, but if you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, Hatsa specifically, uh, what you'll see is they spend about 9.82 hours was the average that they gathered in resting positions. So right now we're in a resting position. The difference is we're up on chairs. You know, so we're forming our body into a certain way in this position. Hunter-gatherer tribes, Hatsa specifically, would be in kneeling positions for a good chunk of the day. They'll be in squatting positions for a good chunk of the day. They'll be in, you know, essentially all the same positions you see your your child in. And when you're in those positions, uh, one, it's just it's helpful with circulating blood, circulating lymph. You know, like cankles are unattractive, but they're also incredibly unhealthy. It's an indication. It's like, oh, we're in trouble. You know, and so what that does outside of just being, you know, making you feel energetically lighter you know and and more attractive because you don't have like big thick ankles Um, you're setting yourself up to stay athletic all the way through your life so when you start to limit range of motion in the ankles limit range of motion in the hips um, that affects your gait pattern the way that you walk the way that you move throughout the world Um, also uh, a elderly needing assisted living the number one leading reason for that is they've you know they fall and they can't get up yeah so so fall risk is this massive thing that's completely specific to westernized culture abandoning the ground it's like unbelievable when you think about it like if you really give that a moment of the amount of sovereignty that's been lost and the amount of 
you know, time and money and energy and worry. Uh, and it's like all of that is wrapped in, is wrapped up in us literally making an, an unconscious um, move away from where we came from, which is just naturally resting in those positions throughout the day. So what would be the prescription? Let's say that someone listens and they go, okay, yeah, that, that sounds good. I want yeah. to. I want to get rid of my cankles. I don't want to be sure. <laughs> falling in, falling and hurting myself when I'm seventy years old. Yeah. What's a good way that someone can integrate these practices into their day? So just changing your environment. You know. So, have you done one with Bruce Lipton? No. Okay. I think we've talked about him. I did a podcast with Bruce Lipton a year and a half ago or so. He's, you know, big has been massive in championing the concept of of epigenetics. You know, and how our environment changes our genetic outcome. And one of the things that he mentioned to me was you know, when he was studying cells in, in Petri dishes, if he wanted to change something about the cell, he wouldn't do anything specifically to the cell itself. It would be changing the culture that the cell exists in. You know, so within your own body, if you're just focusing intrinsically on what's happening inside the body itself, that's a great start. It might get you somewhere. But until you actually change the environment that's forming the body and and the mind and you know your your perception of self and all that to f- to fit that mold, you're just going to keep falling back into the same position. You know, so you can do all the the calf raises or all the you know the couch stretches or all the different kind of therapeutic rehab prehab exercises you want. But what got you into that position in the first place? You know, and so the first place that I would start is saying like, okay, like just create a space in your home. It could be in front of the couch, you know, get yourself like a comfortable rug. So it's inviting to get down to, um, you could put like self care tools in your house, have like a foam roller lying around or get one of those like percussor guns or, you know, a softball to kind of do some myofascial release stuff on, get some Moroccan poofs, you know, or like floor cushions. So suddenly the culture that your cell is inhabiting itself within uh, is shifted to invite the cell to create change in itself just with these like really basic visual cues you see you walk into a space with a a pull-up bar hanging through some doorway just naturally innately, you will have the urge to your arms like suddenly levitate over your head yep. you're like oh, I'm, I'm on the bar <laughs> like what? how did that happen? it's like it's magic the bar is there hands on the bar yeah i didn't have to give you any reps or sets or tell you got and that's the element of, of of play you know so if we can start to make the the movement landscape you know the the environment that we inhabit ourselves in suddenly it's like we become moved by the environment right so when you walk outside if it's kind of cold and you say you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little little cold thermogenesis here i'm not gonna put like all of the layers on you know you go out there and you get moved by the cold suddenly you know you have this herbalation and your hair kind of sticks up and your body activates its own insulation system by causing your hair to raise up it's like a it's like a it's like a, a down sleeping bag on top of your body like whoa it's pretty cool that we have that capacity. We just need to place ourselves into the environmental conditions in order for our body to show up. But inherently your body wants to show up. It's just, we have done such a tremendous job at outsourcing our body's necessity to show up to, you know, to machine or to Amazon. Nothing wrong with that. It's actually brilliant. It's it's like, it's, it's freaking amazing that, (laughs) that the human mind has been able to outsource almost everything to the point that you can lay on a couch press buttons on your and not your phone die. and have food delivered to your face have sex delivered to your face <laughs> like it's pretty freaking impressive like i'm not mad at it you know, I, i'm really just like in awe like like whoa starting from like whacking rocks together to create fire to you know, sex, in the fa- sex in the face to sex in the face off of your blue lit screen like good effort good effort and um, those parts that uh, we've outsourced, not only is it work, but, but work is therapeutic. You know, and so we can experience that or, or, or witness that in the physical body, in your biology. Um, but you can also experience that just in your day-to-day life. And, and, and 
my podcast before this, we were talking about purpose, you know, and like the, the pressure to, to have purpose, you know, and when a person feels like they are living a, a, an hour on purpose or a day on purpose or a life on purpose, it's gratifying, you know, and usually what that is, it's like you did work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you were it. here and you moved yourself to there and you're like, ah, I feel better. I did a thing. I yeah. did a thing. Yeah. I, um, this is something increasingly that I've realized is an important, an important uh, consideration when doing any sort of practice. And especially since we've been out here, me and you have spent a lot of time at Kuya, which is a hot and cold exposure place next yeah. door. Uh, but even training as well, that if you do a training session or any sort of physical practice, the best judge of whether or not it was right for you is whether you feel good afterward or not. Yeah. Do I feel good right. after I've completed this? Mm -hmm. Because if I don't, then what, what, why, why am I doing it? We go out of next door having done three rounds of what 20 minutes hot, three minutes cold-ish, something like that on yeah. average. Yeah. And I feel on top of the world. Like I feel phenomenal. Like the, the best post-sex glow without having to find someone else to do it with. Isn't that great? Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's just, you haven't, you haven't put anything in your body, haven't taken anything. This is completely internally generated yeah. from doing that. And then the same with some of the sessions of training. You know, I came up with this thing called the Mano Pause, right? Which was <laughs> the, toward the end of their 20s, uh, I saw a lot of guys, m myself included, having trained doing like bro split lifting for a decade maybe because we wanted to get big and be attractive to girls or whatever uh, and then you'd realize oh, i get out of breath going up a set of stairs and i can't touch my toes anymore and i'm pretty sure that my body is meant to do more than just bicep curls and you start to revert back to other modes of training so maybe you do brazilian jiu-jitsu or uh, thai boxing or yoga or crossfit or functional fitness or fucking running or athletics whatever right yep. um and I found that my satisfaction after doing those sorts of sessions was so much higher, mm. so much higher after doing that kind of a workout. And I, it just made me think how many people are doing a training modality that they really genuinely don't enjoy and that the body is telling them that they don't enjoy, but that they just stick at it because, and this is probably correct, that something is better than nothing, but that if the end goal of your fitness is to make you be like a happier, healthier, stronger human being, yeah. then you can just use how do I feel post-workout as a pretty good judge of whether or not my training modality at the moment is working. Yep. Well, it's like we were talking about before as well. It's like you don't know what you don't know. You know, so if you are have been, you know, whatever workout dogma or regimen you've subscribed to over the years, you kind of have, you're just like getting work in, just like getting it done. Um that's great. I'd rather someone have. Oh, thanks. You turned my gain up. Yeah, just I was a little bit. It's a little low. You're on a little side. bit quiet. It's fine. Damn, I was noticing that the whole time. Um, yeah. So, some work is better than no work, but you can paint yourself into a corner with your work that eventually you might have to reverse engineer to get yourself out of that corner. What do so, you mean? So, say Ronnie Coleman. Would be a great example of this you know have you have you watched any ronnie coleman stuff it's kind of sad to see him now yeah super sweet guy like really like beautiful heart i don't know him personally but you know i i, I spend i've spent enough hours watching like yep yeah exactly <laughs> but i'm like he's like a sweetie you know but he would be a great example you know of he's he's he did it you know he like like goal arrived at you know, smashed, you smashed the goal. The, the only thing that he ever regretted in his entire bodybuilding career was not no. doing 800 for five. Right, exactly. So he did it for two and he was adamant that he could have back squatted 800 for five instead. Right. It's like, I knew I had another three in me. Yeah. Like, Ronnie, you're, you're, you're bed bound with 75 steel screws in your spine and you yeah. live on the highest dose of painkillers that is legally allowed. And your one regret is that you didn't do 800 for five instead of 800 for two. Yeah. Yep. So for him, he won. Like it ultimately, it's all perception and filters and, you know, how we, it's like, what are your goals? So I think the first thing for someone is to, to have a definitive goal of what it is that you, where do you want to arrive? And I, I think it would, it would behoove people to draw beyond just where do I want to arrive aesthetically, but also coming from a place of, of feel. You know, so how do you want to feel in one week, one year, 
you know, 30 years? You know, what, what are, what are the, the values that are actually, in fact, the most important for you? You know, and I think if people are, are a lot of people are honest or really feel into that question, you probably want to, you know, be feel, you don't want to feel a bunch of pain. You know, you want to feel light in your body. You want to feel flexible in your body. You want to feel maybe adaptable. You want to feel strong. You want to feel confident. You want to be able to play with your kids or your grandkids or be able to get down and pick up a dog. Uh, like those things matter. You know, so I, I would, I would think about how do we start to reverse engineer a program to make sure that we have some of those staples ingrained into the system. And what that's going to look like is you're probably going to be walking. You're probably maybe going to be like lunging, you know, keeping that some that spaciousness open in and around the ankles and around the hips, um, keeping flexibility and adaptability throughout the spine. You know, when the spine is, is impinged, or impinge is a fine word for it, uh, or off neutral be another way of, of, of saying, it feels unstable, it feels unsafe, it doesn't trust you to be strong. And so if you're moving through the world in say like a, you know, like a forward head posture type position or your shoulders are collapsed forward or you have uh, excessive extension in the lower back and the lumbar spine, um, that's sending the signal to your central nervous system that it's not safe to go, you know, deliver power through this system. Yep. Just switches it off. It just switches it off. Super amazing. <laughs> like you're like, thank you. <laughs> because I'd much rather you have some type of parent figure for my, the, the function of my nervous system. Yep. Because I'm not responsible enough for that. Mm hmm. It's the same, a, it's same thing with breathing. It's the same thing with you know cardiac function. It's the same thing with lymphatic function. You're not responsible enough to govern all of these systems. So you have to have the quality control manager that oversees it all. Yeah. So if you're wondering why maybe you feel stiff chronically, or maybe you feel like, man, I've like reached this plateau and I just can't go beyond it, there could be a conversation around joint balance or centration. Centration just being a 50 cent word for, for balance, really. You know, having maximum range, having joints oriented so that I have match, maximum capacity to move in all directions. That's athleticism. That's adaptability. If my joints are pinned up to, you know, the edge, they're on like the precipice of disaster. If I go any further in this one direction, but then I have excessive mobility in the other direction, then inevitably your body, because it loves you, it's going to put you into bracing. And tension. Now, all of a sudden, an analogy for that would be like it's like you left your house with the with the lights on. Yeah. So now, throughout the day, your lights are just. Brrr, you got the air conditioner running. You got the lights on. Vacuum cleaner just. Brrr, just 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 vacuuming nothing, because your body's like you're like <gasps> it's holding that it's it's holding itself together because ultimately, it's it's received the message that if it lets go, um, that would be unsafe. There's a good story that Stu McGill uses about one of the world's strongest man events from a few years ago. And I want to say it was, it was either a, they were back squatting a car or they were overhead pressing, a, like axle pressing a car. And uh, he said, if you watch the event, you can see the rep before the guy is about to fail. It must have been, it was back squatting. You can see the rep before he fails Every single person, and this is true, you can go back and check it. Every single person, when they reset from the penultimate set, uh, penultimate rep before they fail, all of them take a big breath in and just shift their hips a tiny little bit. Yeah. And he's like, that is the spine saying, buddy, you've got nothing left in the tank. We're done. Yep. So yeah. I'm going to kill the power. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then when they go to power out of the bottom, maybe their legs have got something in it, but the spine's decided to pull the, the kill cord. Yeah. And there's just nothing left. So let's say let's say that somebody that, that's listening does a lot of training, and they think, right, okay, this sounds, Aaron, this sounds great. Like I, I need to be functional. I should move in a more holistic manner. I like the idea of creating an environment in my house that kind of engenders a um, parasympathetic, very calm, self love, self work kind of environment. Um, what else can I do? Like, give me some practices. Give me some takeaways sure. that I can do to encourage a more holistic aligned body yeah, protocol. Yeah. Well, so two of the things we mentioned is just making orienting your space so that you just get 
your damn hips below the height of your your knees every now and again like just get yourself down there so that's um, in that sort of upright squatting position and notice yeah, that you sure, do that or anything you, you do that sometimes leaning up against a wall so someone could just get down off the couch and then just lean up against the couch with the, in that bottom of the squat position yeah absolutely yeah just be it, it, and then so a part of that as well as is per mentioned before like engendering a bit more of this this nature of play into your life you know inviting that into even inviting that into conversations you know not being so damn stuffy and serious you know, the way that we communicate to each other, if you look at, and this is going out of like, well, no, this is kind of kind of practices that are in the book, or at least conversations or philosophies of the book. Um, you know, different cultures gesticulate, they use their hand gestures or facial expressions more or less than others. You know, so you go to Italy, suddenly it's like, you're out here and here and here, you know, like, ah! so he grabs you by the shirt, like pulls you in, <laughs> you know, it's like, that's just how we communicate. Like that's, I'm just expressing, you know, and you maybe go someplace else, maybe like, I don't know, you know, I don't know, someplace in the United States or maybe like a Muslim culture would be different than like a, like a Buddhist culture is going to be different than a, you know, each place has their movement signature and there is, there are, are re- there are implications and repercussions of, of each of these, you know? And it's like the, what do they, what do they call it? The French paradox. It's like, how are these damn French people eating all these baguettes? And they're still like pretty darn healthy. How is it? How is it that they managed to eat all these baguettes and they're healthy? I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of elements in that. I think community is the main one. I think people run on community. We run on purpose. We run on community. We run on the sensation that, uh, I've got your back. You've got my back. You know, and I think that when that when we have that sensation of, of safety, again, safety, central nervous system, neutral spine, right? When we come into that place of feeling safe with my community, it allows me at a, a neuromuscular, cellular, like all the way down into ourselves level uh, to be able to relax, to be able to breathe, to be able to, you know, have that. <sighs> And so I think the French paradox has a lot to do with people just getting out and eating together and drinking together and smoking cigarettes and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever brings people together. Like I would take a, a, a smoker, ideally like some organic cigarettes that are just mostly exclusively tobacco and not a bunch of chemicals uh, that gets them to go outside and yep. take a walk yep. and connect and like, you know, have a shoulder to lean on and get some natural sunlight exposure to their eyeballs and maybe get a little cold thermogenesis or maybe a little heat. And, you know, they have their vice yep. in quotations. Uh, I would take that person over the um, orthorexic person. What's that? Orthorexic is a person that's like has an unhealthy obsession with health. Okay. I'd take that person any day for to be on my kickball team, to be on my, you know, my, in my, my, my oh, business. The, the person to be in who's my... obsessed with health but spends all of their time on their own or staring at the screen and never getting the hips below their knees and doesn't have a culture and doesn't yeah. have community and doesn't yeah. have support structure. Yeah. So again, I'm not advising that people take up tobacco. Um, but if you look at that tobacco, what is it? The tobacco, in, in the last conversation, we were talking about dogs. You're moved by your dog. Mm. dog comes into the room you don't just sit there aimlessly you know kind of like monk like staring forward you react and engage with the dog so suddenly your facial patterns change and suddenly your voice tonality might change you know there's a uh, steven steven porges he's a guy that that uh came up with the concept of polyvagal theory he calls it that your voice prosody so when we're communicating, we're literally tuning each other's nervous systems based off of the tone of our voices. You know, so there's a professor from a, a professor of psychology in the '60s called Albert Morabian. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but it's going to maybe wind back to something. Um, came up with a thing called the fifty-five thirty-eight seven principle, and what that suggests is fifty-five percent of our communication comes from body language, and then thirty-eight is coming from the, the tone of our voice and then there's the the last little seven percent is like the actual words that we're conveying so if there's incongruence between what the body is saying and the words with at least i mean i think it's i mean unless you're a complete dummy i think it's higher than 93 percent. but you're going to trust the body 93 percent of the time you know so the cigarette 
<laughs> not condoning cigarettes, you know, but it, 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 it moves the person. Say, oh, I got the cigarette. Okay, we can't smoke inside. I'm walking outside. Ah, dog comes into the room. You know, if you're like a, a, a you know, a, a large, you know, an overweight person that's stuck in your house staring at TV all day long, stressing out about the computer, one of the healthiest things you could probably do for yourself is just start by getting a dog. Buy a fucking dog, man. Get a dog. You're doing all this stuff. You know, you're getting your protein shakes and you got your creatine, you got your glutamine, you know, you got the trainer that you go see th- three times a week and, you know, none of them are going to create the difference that would manifest in your life by having that, just having that accountability and that relationship with that dog. And that's, you know, not even, it's excluding all of like the, the immune benefits of a dog bringing, we we're talking about this as well, bringing nature into the house. Mm. What about a little bit of a pivot? What about sex? And what about relationships? Mm. Mm-hmm. With the work that you've done, have you seen a what dysfunctions do you see with regards to people and their relationship to sex and to their own body and to the way that they judge other people's bodies as well? Well, definitely not my field of depth, um, but I think it's very an interesting conversation that is a physical conversation around that, not that sex isn't physical, uh, but more like anatomical would be the way that shame manifests in the body. You know, so growing up in a culture that doesn't have maybe full ease around sex, you know, or menstruation or having a penis or having an anus or all of these things like, oh, like everyone gets a little uncomfortable if you say anus. (laughs) I was like, whoa, (laughs) pull it back. It was like, yeah, you got one. I got one. Like I took a shit four hours ago, you know, but it's like to, to, to talk about that or to think about that. It's like, oh my God. It's like, what if I didn't take a shit today? It would be dramatically. What if I didn't take a shit for a week? It would be like my whole life would be in shambles. You know, and so I think sex is one of those things. Where it's like our, our nether regions, you know, that part of our body. It's it's uh, we're we're not really um, inculcated for the most part, at least I wasn't, uh, into a culture that has a lot of acceptance of those spaces. You know, in the way that shame manifests in the body. Just look at it physically. If you're ashamed, if you're embarrassed. You know, without getting metaphysical, you know, saying like, oh, shame, there's deep tension in the perineum and the cells and the root chakra or any kind of just kind of random, random bits. Feel in your body, what does shame feel like? You know, like for, for you, if you suddenly like tightness. felt. It's like a sort of a stiffness, yeah, stiffness. and a tightness in the, in the stomach, in the head. Yeah. Or maybe a collapse could be a flavor. Folding of forward. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, what does. um Uh, pride what does strength feel like what does sadness feel like you know the whole gamut of emotions you know that's that's um sir william james who's he's like widely known as the the father of modern psychology he was one of the the preeminent leaders in uh the conversation of not just a, a top down physiology being like the mind affects the body you know so we see a bear i'm scared i run you know, and I respond, uh, we could just as easily flip that around and go bottom up and say, I see a bear. I have a physiological response. It moves my body into this state that we deem to be fear. And that perpetuates the feeling and the emotion. And then that winds back and it's this ping pong, boom, boom, feedback system back and forth, mind, body, mind, body, mind, body. It doesn't matter where it starts or where it ends, like the chicken or the egg question. It's like both, whatever, like it doesn't matter. They're inextricably tied. So if we grow up in a culture that inherently there's a, maybe it's not overt shame, but maybe just like shadow, you know, or blank spots, like there's some pages in our physiology, in our anatomy, that aren't as well filled out. You know, so uh, there's a a term, you ever heard the term homunculus? No. Homunculus, it means little man. And essentially it's like, well, just flip my my, uh, toothpick here. Uh, Homunculus means little man. And it's it's essentially like the, the way that, it's like the neurological real estate that our body has to 
sensation uh, or uh, of how different appendages experience sensation, the amount of real estate that's offered to that sensory reception in those various different parts in the body, you know, and so your fingers will have in this little man image, it's like literally a, a you could, we could, you could look it up. It's a really interesting th- thing to see. Um, they've got like really big lips, you know, and they've got like really big hands and, you know, pretty reasonably sized genitals actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's got a piece. Yeah. He's got a piece he's on got him. A, he's got a piece on him. <laughs> um, you know, so that distribution of sensory awareness can change depending upon a person's uh, life experience. You know, so there's some places in the body that for some people that might literally be like a shadow place. Like you could numb that space out. You know, some people don't have a lot of sensation in certain parts of their body, like maybe like their back. You know, you could rub a, you know, a, a paper clip or a feather or something in certain parts of the body. It's like, no, I've literally shut that part down. And then it becomes this whole process of re-engaging and reintegrating that that aspect of yourself. And do you think symbolically that can happen with regards to shame around sex and our bodies, not just in terms of how we perceive them physiologically, if we can touch them and if we can get feedback, but how we see them symbolically in our minds? I think so. What do you think? Yeah, certainly, man. I mean, the... It's definitely since being out here in Austin, fuck, like people here have got a, a very, some people here have got a very liberal, very open uh, relationship to sex and sexual practices and talking about sex. Far more, I don't know whether it's a British thing, maybe it is a little bit, but far more than I've been used to in the UK. And I'd say I'm, you know, relatively open about being happy to talk about things that have gone well or badly or that I'd like or don't like during sex. But yep. Fuck, out here is a another level. I don't know whether that's. I don't, and just because you talk about a thing a lot doesn't mean that you have a healthy relationship with it. Oh yeah, but I mean, this not being able to talk about it at all probably isn't a sign of a good relationship with it. Also not. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's been it's been interesting being out here. Um, it's the flexibility again. It comes back to to adaptability and flexibility. If you're if something makes you uncomfortable, if I say a word. You know, any of the words I said previously mm, and mm. you go, oh, yeah, anus. a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. You're like, ah, cool. That's a place that there is, if you choose to take it, an opportunity probably for you to uncover some, um, you know, internal impingement. Mm. You don't need to address it, but it's, it's there. If someone pisses you off, you know, or if someone makes you feel away, it's probably some reflection back into some insecurity within yourself. Or else there wouldn't be a, a charge around it. What so, are you working on at the moment, personally? Like, what what's the next 2022? If you were to look back at the end of 2022 and consider it a success, what would have been a a development that you would have gone through? Well, I mean, something that we've talked about previously is I, I have a, a a bit of a a tendency of in I don't know if I enjoy it, but. I have a proclivity towards chasing, you know, and that was kind of something that we've been talking about in relation to like to female relationships and something that I'm observing in myself, you know, when something is unavailable, it becomes highly prized. And when the availability begins there, sometimes I, I, not sometimes I I can completely notice um, the opportunity to work with that for me is, is, a resistance around that or a disinterest uh kind of like a like an avoidant type pattern you know and so for me it's like aha okay well the, there's there's the work you know so now it's it's my the onus is on on me alone to engage with it um or to go to the next and re-perpetuate patterns you know so that for me it's like looking in and, and really being honest with what that is uh, what do you think it is likely my story for that which i think that's another thing to be cautious of is being over too attached to her stories yeah over rationalizing or over narrative narrati- mm-hmm. narratizing whatever it is that you're supposed to do yeah yeah and, it, and that's when things things that kind of trump our stories like maybe some type of you know breath work ceremony thing or some life event that was like dragged you outside of the narrative that you've yeah. tried to wrap around and rationalize a story yeah. with yeah that's an interesting yeah. way or to whatever it. it may be suddenly you're like oh okay story 
out, you know, story on the side. Yes. Now here's like God reality. <laughs> yeah. Like there's yeah, like yeah. a there's like the higher purview comes in. It's like okay, we don't need words right now, little Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is we're just on truth. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that those moments happen when they happen. Um, but for me, the narrative that I have that I think probably has some level of sense to it is I think that my mother was who I've did I've done actually full like I don't know, like 90 minute podcast with her and I was like I think it's a I, I know it was the only podcast that I've ever like really properly broke down wept in a couple times um and uh she had a a, a background of um some level of abuse. I'm not sure if I shared in the podcast or not, so I don't know if it's appropriate to share, but uh, she learned that it's not appropriate to not be okay. You know, so kind of like good vibes only Mm -hmm. type thing, which is incredibly dangerous, you know, because then you, you lack decompression, you know, so suddenly you look, you pin it up, you know, any of those sensations that would be deemed unfavorable. It's just like, okay, those don't go out. They go in and now they just sit and fester and kind of ferment. Um, and so getting the signal that everything needs to be okay, everything needs to like be all righty. Um, I think that there was a certain level of, she was very caring, very sweet, you know, always made me sandwiches and always like had my back. Uh, but I think there was a certain emotional vulnerability that was, um, challenging for her to access Mm -hmm. and i think i subconsciously picked that up and so when there is emotional vulnerability specifically with a female um it's it's scary to me you know and so i'm like oh this is like a lot you know and so within that i think i've adapted and a lot of people have have done this you know i've adapted to be able to create rapport with with quickness you know so what i've the because of a general avoidance of depth i've reintroduced that bandwidth into like superficial and so i think you have have this as well probably for different reasons Um, but an ability to connect with new people and find common ground pretty quick uh and yours you think is maybe part of a defense mechanism yeah for sure that's interesting yeah definitely fuck that's interesting and then when it goes to a certain level i'm like okay too far too too far far. (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) but we're like you know, like fast bros or fast, you know, yep. bro and bro and sister, like real fast. And then there's a certain level because that that part's so well developed. There's yep. a certain level that it's it's kind of like, okay. And as soon as you're outside of that safety position. Yeah, I am. Um, Hopefully that wasn't too much information about my. No, not at all. I think up. it's fucking interesting, man. Like it's really interesting to think that you could compensate for a fear of depth or a, a hesitation around depth by overselling on rapport mm-hmm. or overselling on uh immediate connection mm-hmm. and that makes a lot of sense um I, it doesn't resonate with me personally but i can absolutely see how it would happen mm. um so getting through that trying to get yourself past the slightly more i guess juvenile areas of of the avoidant attachment mm-hmm. side i mean i have a ton of friends and i think that this is I'd be very interested to find out how this relates to people that are whatever high agency or high achieving guys. Um, A lot of my buddies that are high achievers also have that attachment style, which is funny because people are prepared to uh, push their limits in so many places. You know, if we needed to do a, a 24 hour workout or a, you know, an unbelievable sauna and cold session or whatever, like pick what, pick whatever challenge it is that you want to do. Uh, and yet there are these sort of deep, dark holes that sometimes don't get uncovered quite so easily. Maybe they're a little bit more difficult to see what's going on. Maybe they're just a, an area of the territory that we can't get rid of as simply. But it is strange that... Well, there's nothing to get rid of. Okay, to deal with, I know that perhaps. you heard yourself probably as you're saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to 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 come into healthier relationship to face, with to face on and healthy just on. means whole. That's like the original meaning of health. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So whole coming back to the body integrated. 
So if I disconnect the parts, you know, I got my bicep brachialis and I got my triceps and I got the, you know, the, the multiple heads of the quads and I got, you know, really sp- specifically breaking down those individual points um, that can potentially lead to a, a, a disintegration of the, the whole body working together. Mm. And then that creates, you know, cacophony. But there's something about the fact that a lot of my friends that can push themselves in many other areas still have as their one of the final bastions of challenge is their avoidant attachment. Oh yeah, it's the big one. You think that's the whatever the Achilles heel? It's not the. I mean, everybody's got their own thing, you know. But that's I think relationship is one of the ultimate reflections upon yourself you know and getting into deeper awareness or more authentic awareness with your relationship to your parents and i think a lot of it comes back to that you're like oh, okay interesting you know and so if you do allow if you you know if you, you do play the game and you actually say like cool like all right pushing chips in you know and, and actually be there for it um yeah, I mean, if if you really, how many people really want to look at themselves? Like, I think we all say that we do, but I think the the only reason to be afraid of a psychedelic trip or maybe a relationship or, you know, psychedelics are, are another really good example of that. Like, I think a, a bad trip, most people that I've talked to that have had bad trips, like I've had things that I've deemed like, oh, that would felt pretty like bad. Um, it was just an exposure to some aspect of my myself or my orientation to the world that I was uncomfortable with and I didn't want to look at and I was in that time in that in that moment I was kind of almost felt like forced to be in that that space to say like okay here you are here's your relationship with you know fill in the blank whatever the thing is um and then wanting to get out but the the way to get to the other side of that into you know finding like healing and ease and you know all of that holism health um is through it and it's you can either you know wrestle the relationship or wrestle the mushroom or wrestle you know whatever which you will not win i've tried i've tried <laughs> like, i've had, I've had i can guarantee of- i can guarantee it with 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 the mushroom yeah. you will not win the analogy that i used was it's like being sat on a, a firework and as you try to steer it to the left or the right, it goes, yeah, and just it only spirals makes off. it only makes it worse. Yeah, it only was, gets bigger. Wasn't a good strategy for you me. know. It's like the what's the what's this what's the, the the gal with the snake heads? You chop off the snake heads. Is that one? Which has got like tons of snake heads. You I chop one off. It grows when you. Yeah, it's the hydra. Yeah, yeah, it's the hydra. Yeah, you know. So ultimately, I'm trying to you know, hopefully not getting like excessively metaphysical or esoteric, but you know. Ultimately, I think a, a relationship is an opportunity. Um, you know, just like a like a like you know like the mushroom thing. You know, surrender. In my experience, surrender has been um, the ticket to ease. You know, like like not fighting. You know, in that moment, it's like cool. Whatever the thing is, uh, you don't need to fight. And it's interesting. Have you had that experience with yourself at all? wrestle wrestling a thing and instead of fighting the thing coming to a place of just like you know what take me yeah i mean my first ever mushroom trip was precisely this and i just refused to let go yeah so for whatever five hours i just wrangled everything right. and just kept kept that puppy kind of as under as much control as i could which was just made for a very very uncomfortable so what Terrence McKenney said, the only thing you can do, the only mistake you can make with, with psychedelics is not taking enough. <laughs> well, that was five grams for my first ever time. Uh, and even with that, I was like, I'm going a, I'm to a fucking wrap you up in a big, big prison and see if I can hold on. Yeah. And I pretty much managed to, which is just like looking back. But, but then you're not, you're not exactly super lucid at the time. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I certainly resonate with when you, when you think about being in the body, right? And you notice that you've been sat in a meeting or in a situation with someone and you've been tense and then you kind of check in with yourself and you, <sighs> mm-hmm. and everything just eases up a little bit or you open your gaze. The best cue that I've learned about this, I learned this this year uh, from an embodiment coach was about 
um, just using the peripherals of your vision. Yeah. So just using that open gaze. And man, I love that cue so much. It just reminds me that, look, there's so much more going on. You do not need to focus just there. You can have all of this beautiful vision outside of you. Yeah. Um, there's a whole chapter in the, the Align Method book about that. that all was, right, tell yeah, me. Andrew, Andrew Huberman, who he's you know popularized a lot of these conversational essays, and he thankfully um, edited through the whole thing for me and kind of, you know, like pointed me in the right directions so of that. And I, I, mean, just, I owe so much to his mind and his, his research. Um, but yeah, I mean, the way that you use your eyes, your, your eyes are continuous with your central nervous system, you know? So similarly, this is one of the things I was, I was going to eventually likely get to in relation to environmental conditions, changing the visual environment isn't just adding visual cues that cause you to do what would look like mobility or exercise it's also changing the the visual environment in the sense of like you know open some windows um ideally get full spectrum light into your eyeballs you know so it's not just when you're when you're looking at light through windows it's going to be blocking some percentage of the, of, of the either uva or uvb spectrum out um, and being able to relax your eyes and awareness that when i am in that panoramic like I'm just taking it all in that that lens of perception. It's sending a signal into the rest of your physiology, which is probably an anchored pattern for again, millennia back, like, you know, generations, generations, like forever that when you are just taking it all in, just spacing out probably almost never in history, have you just spaced it out and taken it all in and been under attack. Right. And so, it's a similar thing talk. And then when you're myopically focused in suddenly, okay, cool. We're taking it all in. We're just gathering information about the whole, or maybe not gather information. Screw that. We're just, ah, we're just basking in the moment. We're fed, you know, we've hunted. Oh. And then suddenly there is a threat. What do your eyes do? You know, it all focuses in on that single point. I've been so, thinking about this to do with smartphones. Oh, of course. Yeah. So much about you're looking down and you're looking down and to the right, you know, so you're looking down or, or, you know, if you're lefty, you know, which would be more rare, but you're looking down into a specific direction. So your eyes act like reins to your neuromuscular system. So you can do this, you know, put your, your fingertips back the, the bottom of your skull. It's called the suboccipital ridge and just look up and down and you'll feel those muscles it's <laughs> called suboccipital <laughs> muscles engaging, right? Yeah, so That's your so eyes. Funny. So same thing in in um, it was in chimpanzees. This has been researched. Their <clears throat> the the cochlea in their ear will change direction with the eyes. So when you are looking to the right to to some potential threat or whatever the thing is, literally even their their auditory system. Oh, so their hearing opens up as their eyes move. Almost it will it will orient towards that thing. No way. Which is kind of an interesting thing for people that are like, you know, into jujitsu and wrestling and have like cauliflower ear. I wonder how that affects affects things. But uh, yeah, man, your your visual system is so deeply tied into your sense of uh, either you know alertness or uh, you know executive function, get her done, or relax, digest, rest. Uh, you know, so that's in in the book in the Align Method. The the, the really. <coughs> The intention of it isn't so much to have like a step-by-step method. It's more, uh, you know, a, a philosophy to reorient the way that a person engages with their body in any situation. You know, so are you from the Victor Frankl yes. logotherapy, man search for meaning. Uh, one of the things that he said that I align with is uh, that he said he's he's more like an optometrist than you know like a psychology psychologist. You know, so he's just he's just working with people's perception of the world, you know, the way that they process information, their filter, you know. And so I think that that's a really valuable approach to one's fitness. You know, it's fitness isn't a thing that I do. Fitness is a thing that I am. You know, so all the time throughout every day, they're all a bunch of opportunities if you have the education on how to engage with those opportunities. You know, so you're just filled with these fun layer, fun levers all over your body. So your eyes, they will change the way that your, your, your mental emotional state based off of the way that you use them. If you have that information, you can leverage it. Same thing with your auditory environment. Same thing with your, you know, the, the sense of touch. 
certain sensations or textures will make you feel one way, certain sensations and textures will make you feel another way. Uh, your visual environment, an interesting thing that you have to fact check, fact check this one, but I heard uh, with real estate, if you're selling a place and you have like like pointy plants out front, that sends an indication to potential buyers to, to stay away. No way. I mean, you gotta look it up. There's, there's, a, there's a whole field of, of study you'd probably appreciate called embodied cognition. Body cognition essentially is is the way that um, we 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 think and feel uh, based off of our, our our physical experience. You know, so I'm I'm sure you've heard of like the clipboard studies. You know, where if you give somebody your resume and it's on like a big thick beefcake clipboard, they're like, oh fuck yeah, like <laughs> this guy really knows. You know, he's he's serious. You know, he's stable. He's supported. I like this guy. Right. If you and so that's that tactile experience of like, man, this guy feels like oh, I can trust him. Right. Same thing with you know people that are tend to be taller or you know lower voices is something we were talking about before. It's like oh, like something trustworthy about that. Like it feels like feels powerful. And like they might just be a tall asshole. <laughs> like it doesn't necessarily mean anything. <laughs> but the way that we cognate that or the way our our embodied experience of that is like, oh yeah, I trust it. You know, same thing with if we're we have a cold beverage and someone goes into a job interview or a warm beverage. If right now we had icy, you know, whatever, some some lemonades or something like that, but like icy cups, uh, based off of research, we would perceive this experience as being a little bit more. That's why I was noticing the temperature of the room. We ex- perceive this experience as being a little bit kind of like more closed, a little bit colder. If you give me like a hot cocoa and it's warm and we got a, a fire going in the background and we can hear the crackling of the fire, suddenly that's changing my perception to say like, wow, man, I just feel so safe here. There's something about you, Chris, that makes me feel safe. It's like, is it me or is it just the environment that we're having this mutual experience? Shit's crazy, man. This more holistic view of the body overall and of fitness is something that, I don't know, maybe to you and maybe the people that you're speaking to, it's kind of, uh, how would you say, obvious or it makes a complete amount of sense. But to me, this is like an entire new world. Like <laughs> That's a, com- great. A, a whole new world. It makes uh, sense, though. It's simple. Well, the human system, the human system is, is one thing altogether. It's yeah. broken up into component parts. But working on each component part without taking into account all of the other things doesn't really seem to make sense. And right. you, some of the things that you've mentioned to me since we've been hanging out to do with, um, you can tell a lot about a person's personality by the way that they move, when they walk into a sauna or a, a, a restaurant or sit down at a date or the way that they hold themselves or the way that they gesture or whatever, right? right? Like, that. why? Why is that the case? If it wasn't that we were such a global system where our cognition and our physicality and our emotions and our social status and our confidence and our blah, blah, if it wasn't the case that all of those were together, why would it be that from something I can induce how somebody is in a completely unrelated area, so to speak? Yeah. It's not. It's that we're one closed system. Yeah. Um, so you've got a special revised paperback edition yeah. of the Align Method coming out. Where can people get that? Uh, yeah, well, I, hopefully your bookstore would be great. That would be very Align Method-esque of you to take a walk outside. Uh, ideally remove sunglasses, you know, get full spectrum light. There's a lot of British people listening. They don't the need old, sunglasses at the moment. Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, that's a, it, it, you know, it, it tunes your your neurochemistry, you know, that, that light penetrating your eyeballs. A reason that I know that that was a cue to wrap up, so don't say, don't spout more more factoids. Fire, fire away, man. <laughs> factoids, we're here for the factoids. <laughs> Fucking keep them coming. <laughs> but you're... Uh, a, a big reason that that such a high percentage of, of people uh, are becoming myopic, you know, specifically like China is something like 93%, like a really high percentage of adolescents are becoming myopic. Um, same How thing. How do you define myopic? Nearsighted. Okay. Yeah, we, we see near well, far, not so easy. Uh, so one potential conversation there would be that we're just practicing nearsightedness all the time. So those ciliary muscles and all the muscles that help change the shape of the lens to be able to refract that light so it comes into clear vision. We're like, well, you're only using the close ones, so you're going to have a problem with the other ones. Uh, but a, a bigger part of the conversation is is the the impact that 
natural sunlight has on the the structure and the shape and the, the the chemical structural makeup of your eyeballs. So sun, it literally the exact process I can't go through because I'm you know that's not like my my specialty. Um, but sun literally it changes it, it it's you know it's a physical thing it's like a nutrient you know and it changes the structure and the makeup of of your eyes you know, and so when you're going outside it's not just like a relax the eyes you know it's an opportunity to downregulate the nervous system or calm the freak down it's literally it's like you're you're nourishing the, the structure of your eyeballs through that exposure to the sunlight. You know, so sunlight, it just, it, it's so healing in so many capacities. And I know I didn't, you know, break down exactly what's happening within that system. So maybe come back, I'll, I'll go deeper in the research of what that system is exactly. Um, but experts pretty much unanimously align that sunlight, it, it changes the structure and the makeup of your eyeballs. And so you, you need it for healthy eyes. You need it for healthy everything. Doing a morning walk here in Austin because the weather tends to be, it's a bit muggy sometimes on a morning, but maybe 50% of the days it's sunny. Yeah, A morning walk with sunshine is so good. I always mm-hmm. do the walk anyway, but in the UK, if I was to do it at the time I'm doing it out here, it would still be dark. And that infrared light specifically in the morning, you're, you're setting, and I think a lot of people listen to this, by, you know, by now they know about this, uh, but you're setting the circadian rhythm for the rest of the day. So when you're waking up, that, that light when the sun's first coming up, it's tuning your whole neurophysiology your neurochemistry your hormones your endocrine system to be alert to be up you know it's like this it's 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 like the it's a it's a a bookend start of the day i only learned recently that the reason that we get a burst of energy after the lights go out is that that would be adaptive for our ancestors to get themselves home while the sun was setting Mm. Hmm, that's cool. I never heard that. So this is in Johan Hari's Stolen Focus, which is coming out in the new year. It'll be really good. I've read half of it. Um, and he mentioned that one of the reasons that we're struggling to have attention at the moment is because of a lack of sleep. And the lack of sleep is partly due to the fact that we use blue screens at night. But what is the reason that blue screens have such an effect on our energy levels and our ability to fall asleep easily. Mm. Uh, And one of the proposed reasons for this is that when we go from light to dark, our bodies get a kick of energy. Why would that be useful? Well, if you're out hunting or not in your cave or not at your camp, it would be pretty good for you to just get a little extra kick. I've had that experience many times, like camping or, you know, rock climbing or something where you're out in the woods the sun sets and the sun and goes down, down you're like we gotta go yep <laughs> and suddenly we're running you yep. know and you get that that full sympathetic yep. burst Response. of like we and gotta it, get to where we're going i never thought about that what johan's saying is that let's say that you're using your phone and watching netflix until you go to sleep and then precisely at the moment when you're about to well, try and get sleep, a little juice up precisely that's really fascinating some interesting stats around uh, e-readers that it doesn't seem like they have the same sort of response. Yeah, they're not emitting I, that light. I need to speak to Huberman about that, mm-hmm. um, but I don't think that they have the same effect. The other thing that's interesting that I wanted to, to, to mention in relation to eyes that I just I think is just so cool is that humans are one of the only mammals to have uh, white sclerus, that, that the white part, so we can see the orientation and the positioning of our eyes. It's mm-hmm. called the they call it the eye co- eye coordination hypothesis. I think is the like the it's so that the we can see term for other people can see what we're looking at. Yeah, and so the 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 potential suggestion for that like like a like an evolutionary adaptation would be to be able to signal to each other for hunting, you know. And so you'll see oh, this, and the reason wow. that they would suggest that is, is you see this with with certain dogs, so like more like pack animals. They also have that indication to be able to see where their eyes are are oriented. Uh, and then also to be able to see the the wellness of a person, you know. So, it's, and this is becomes interesting in the whole, you know, like the the year of the lockdowns and everything. It's like we have we're pretty good senses when someone's unwell, yep. <laughs> like you know. And that's that's body language, that's voice tonality, that's reading the scleras of somebody's eyes. That's you know, we go Chinese medicine route and you know see the what's the. They have like some furry stuff on their tongue or their cracks in their tongue. We have all of these millions or billions of bits of visual information and all fact olfactory information as well. The way we smell, uh, suggesting whether that person is healthy to be close to. 
somebody has terrible breath, you're like, get the hell away from me. Terrible body odor, you're like, please don't give me a hug. No, thank you. If someone's sniffling, you're like, not interested. If someone's got bloodshot eyes or they have like yellow eyes, you're like, I don't know what's going on. Is this hepatitis? Is this like, there's something going on here. I would love for you to visit a doctor. I love you, you know, but you need to go. <laughs> like you got to sort this out and then come back to the tribe. And then even if within yourself, if you are that guy or that girl, you're like, okay, I need to pull myself out of the tribe. Self-regulatory. I need to sort this out. You know, and so our subconscious intuition is just so fucking cool. <laughs> We've just learned to, you know, kind of outsmart ourselves and you will never outsmart yourself. It's the same concept of trying to put together your 640 muscles and your 360 joints. You will not be successful. But if you allow yourself to kind of listen to that inner wisdom, you know, and the, the integration of the inner wisdom and the modern wisdom, ultimately the modern wisdom would be that, that inner wisdom. Um, I think suddenly it's like maybe surrendering to that, which is a surrendering term. I think that's, that can be kind of funny for some people. Um, but behind that, uh, that's I think that's where true wisdom is. Aaron Alexander, ladies and gentlemen, Align podcast, mm. Align method book, mm. everything will be linked in the show notes below. Any other stuff that people should check out? No, I think that's it. I mean, thanks again for making this happen. I really enjoy this. It was a really, really fun conversation. I appreciate the way that your mind operates and the way that you create space for uh, other minds to to turn the way that they do. So thank you for creating the space for this. Um, yeah, go check out the Align podcast with you. I really enjoyed that conversation. Yep. Um, another one they could check out would be the the Bruce Lipton conversation if they want to go deeper into some of these topics. And then the Align Method book is coming out January 11th. And so they could get it. This is before that. They can pre-order it. It's on Amazon or you know Barnes & Nobles or whatever. And I think that's it, man. I appreciate you. Awesome, dude. First of many. Yeah, let's keep doing it. All right, over and out. Pow, pow. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace. <laughs>